So yeah, just enter your name into the chat. That's how we'll be tracking attendance. I'll mention that again later. Krista? Um, yeah? While we're waiting, um, and I don't know if it's appropriate to ask you right now, but any news on how, since we're not administering the NYSA slot, is the state planning something for the summer or what can we do for next year? Is there a screener I heard that might come out from the state or? So no decisions have been made yet. They are working on it. There's a few different scenarios that they're considering. Oh, great. Um, yeah, we're not really sure what's going to happen. I, you know, everyone's figuring this out as we go along. But they are thinking about it, which is good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So I, without going into details or getting technical, the, the nicest slide is complicated because it takes such a long time to administer. And then it takes a long time for the scores to be calculated. So if we were to do that in the fall, you wouldn't get scores until January or February, and then that's useless. So they're, I know they're think, trying to think of some creative ways to address the situation. And you know, as soon as we hear more, we will definitely share it with the field right away. Um, so in the meantime, I'm going to start our presentation. Um, while Heather is finding Helene, and we might go out of order a little bit for our agenda, but that's fine. So in the meantime, um, if I could just ask everyone, if you are not already muted, to mute yourself. Um, we're, we'll take some questions at the end. As we go along, you can put them in the chat and we'll try and address them. So the first thing I wanted to do is walk you through our website. We've made some updates and some changes if you haven't seen them. Um, there is, you should be able to see our website now. <clears throat> you know, there's, I'm sure you've all seen the emails about our Tune In Tuesdays, which are very successful. Um, we are putting the videos of the Tune In Tuesdays online. We now have a new, page on our website. Our website's kind of weird. If your window's not big enough, the menu bar is at the top. But if your window is big enough, the menu is down the left hand side. But if you go here to the supporting L's online page, you can see everything that we're posting about how to support L's in an online instruction. That was not 30 minutes. Um, we have tune in Tuesdays. You went, at, you went down at 13 after. Classroom, Powtoon that Erica created. Um, and we have some other resources, digital age teaching for L's. So this is a resource for you and for you to share with your teachers. We've been sending a lot of things out over the internet, but if you're like me, your email is more full than ever, so it's easy to miss. So we'll send it again after this meeting. The other thing I wanna point out is if you go to, you know, from our website, you can register for all of our events and we've just rearranged it. So let me see if I can find it here. Online PD registration, anytime, we have something coming up. It's gonna, we're going to do it through my learning plan. As usual, it's the easiest and quickest way for everyone to register for events. Some of the things that are in here have been in here for a long time. We're trying to figure out how to put them online as well. So if you are registered for other things, you'll be hearing from us about um, having those things online. Um, the next thing is um, you should have been contacted by uh, one of our resource specialists. Each resource specialist has a caseload of districts that's assigned to them. And hold on one second. Hey guys. Um, sorry, working from home. I'm sure you've all been there. So one of our resource specialists should have contacted you um, to reach out. The best way to contact us right now is through our email at our contact us page. Um, you should have our emails. You always have my email. I'm 
everyone has that. And if I can't address it, I'll forward it to one of our resource specialists and we'll be sure to get back to you. Um, we are working on getting Google voice numbers in case somebody needs to call us. Once those are available, um, we will send those out to the field as well. Um, I already mentioned to enter your name into the chat. So, so far we are good. Um, Heather? Oops, there. Yes. Yeah, okay. I see Helene, so we're good. <laughs> so I'm okay. going to, hold on, switch. We're going to switch over to our next presentation, which is Helene Marshall, who will be talking about synchronous online flipped learning approach, also known as SOFLA. Helene, I love how much you love your acronyms. <laughs> it, helps, well, it helps to remember stuff, I know. I have, I have to say, I got that from Stephen Krashen, who once said, you want to be famous, make up terminology. <laughs> Beautiful. And, and I, I have to say, <laughs> we, I have to tell everyone how lucky we are to have Helene presenting on this topic at such an important, important time in our education uh, world, right? This is what it's all about. Um, and we are, by uh, virtue of this virus, required to be teaching online only, which is unusual. And um, if you're familiar with flip learning, Helene is the expert. And, and Guy, I believe you have a little bio. Uh, I do. would like to introduce Helene. And I have the distinct uh, uh, honor of, of having presented with Helene and working with her. She's really uh, an incredible expert. We're lucky to have you. Thank you, Helene. And Guy, I give it over to you. Thank you. So many of us already know that Dr. Helene Marshall is a professor of education and director of language education programs at Long Island University Hudson campus, where she teaches courses in TESOL and multicultural education, primarily online using the SOFLA model, which we will have an opportunity to work with today. Her research interests include uh, leveraging instructional technology and education, culturally responsive and sustaining education, and non-traditional approaches to grammar help? instruction. Did you get help? Her most recent book just published is Meeting the Needs of SLIFE, a Guide for Educators. So once again, uh, Helene, thank you so much for joining us and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, I need to uh, <clears throat> share my screen, okay, great. Okay. All right. So first, I would like to thank everyone at ES BOCES. They're one of the most buttoned up BOCES there is. I mean, they're very organized and uh, they've had a lot of communication with me over the last few days. I want to thank especially Heather and Krista for inviting me. And, um, and Guy, uh, I guess that it's okay, everyone seems to call you that. <laughs> so uh, I wanna thank you for all the behind the scenes work that you've done uh, to assist me as I got ready for this presentation. Okay, so, um, so this is called uh, SOFLA and uh, it's the synchronous online flipped learning approach. And so what I'm going to try and do here today is give you what we used to call, when I worked at a BOCES, when it was called the BTAC way back when, we would call this kind of a one hour an awareness level. So remember, we're not doing deep dives into any of this. It's an awareness level. So this is to give you an idea of what this model is and whether you might be interested in, in working with it, trying it. Uh, and, but it's not going to give you um, that tomorrow you can jump in necessarily. Uh, although some of you are so experienced in what you've been doing, you may be able to have very few speed bumps as you go forward. All right, so our first step is to take a poll. Of course, we're in Zoom, right? We got to do polls. So the first poll is coming up and please respond. And I have to ask you to be, of course, honest. Tell the truth. You all see the poll? It's 
So we're getting responses. It seems everybody is able to see it. If you're having any trouble, just give me a, a note in the chat window. There are going to be several polls, so it's, it's worth making sure that you're up and running to do the polls. And as soon as we get a reasonable number, because we have limited time, even if we don't get everyone, we're gonna show the results. And right now we have 36 out of 73 responded. So I'd, I'd like to give you just a few minutes since, uh, not minutes, a few more moments, uh, since this is an essential question to moving forward. Just another couple more seconds. All right, it seems like we have 50% of our uh, viewers have voted. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to end the poll and share the results. Now, does everyone see the results? Oh, here they come. All right, so uh, looking at these results, more than half of you did the pre-work. Now, you're very highly motivated. Uh, you knew you were going to be learning about this. You knew there was pre-work. I would say this is a good result for a first time pre-work. And I'm going to ask you to do something. If you answered no, that you did not do the pre-work, what I'd like you to do is go to the link, which is right there for you. Go to the link and someone could please put it in the chat. That would be great. Okay. Put it I'll in the chat. And I'd like you to go to the pre-work, but you don't have to do the whole thing. There's a video, don't watch it. Then there are four questions, answer them. And then after the questions, there is an instruction to read an article. You don't have time for that piece. Okay, so just do the four questions and then come back and join us. Bye. Okay, go do your pre-work, four questions. And don't worry, because while you're gone, I won't be talking about self-law. I have two other slides I'm gonna show and I'm gonna talk about something else, also important, but not SOFLA. So please do your four questions. You'll feel more connected to the webinar if you've answered and read and answered those questions. Thank you. Okay, so we're gonna go on now. And I think I can close it. Uh, so, um, so those of you who are here right now, uh, I wanna just start with every presentation I give, I now begin with my mantra. And the mantra is my overarching philosophy of education. And it applies to SOFLA, it applies to everything that I do. And it's create fertile spaces. This is our mantra. So even though your mics are not on, I'd like you close the door wherever you are and everyone say our mantra. I'm gonna say one, two, three, and everyone say create fertile spaces. When you say a mantra, it helps you to take it in you know, make it intake, not just input, all right? So let's all say, create fertile spaces. One, two, three. Create, create fertile, fertile spaces. spaces. Okay, now in other, uh, in other PD, I go into great detail about each of the three words, what it means and why it's so important. This is simply, as I said, awareness level, create fertile spaces. And my main pitch here is that if we focus on creating fertile spaces, we can do it online, not just in person. And so I'm asking you to focus less on covering curriculum, delivering instruction and meeting standards and focus more in your online instruction on creating fertile spaces, because if you don't do that, the rest will not happen. And then I have my four E's, equity, enrichment, engagement and empowerment. Those are the four E's. And again, this is not a session on that, but I wanted them to get a chance to do the pre-work. I will show you the basic slide of my four E's, equity being only the beginning, which just gives access. That's not sufficient for our L's. We need to give them enrichment. That's why the deficit model is so damaging. They deserve guest speakers. They deserve exciting projects. They deserve all the enrichment that we can give them and not just the bare bones education, because that leads to their engagement and motivation. Then they're more active in their participation and we want them to be active, not just passive, all right? And if they're active, they'll feel empowered and they'll feel ownership of the learning experience, which is our ultimate goal, okay? So there are the fertile spaces and now I think we can welcome back everyone. 
Thank you for going to do the four questions. You're back and now you're ready for the second poll. Now the second poll is important because it gets at prior knowledge. So everything that I'm doing today, I'm doing for you as the audience so that you can experience SOFLA. But remember when you are, your, are teaching, you wanna do a similar set of polls. Did you do the pre-work and then getting it prior knowledge? So this is the prior knowledge poll. And in our case, it's flipped learning. In your case, it would be something about the past tense or something about making requests or something about the curriculum uh, in a subject area. So you wanna get prior knowledge. Please answer. Please answer the poll. What is your response? And this gives you an idea at the outset where people are. And again, Heather, you can just gauge it by how many you got. While you're doing the poll, I'd like to mention about the pre-work. It's very important to insist on the pre-work, but not be punitive. If you're punitive, you're ruining the model. So what you wanna do though is be firm and eventually peer pressure and fear of missing out FOMO <laughs> will eventually get them so that they will do the pre-work because that's a major concern of teachers. Uh, if you give up on it, it won't happen. Okay, do we have enough? Uh... You're muted. Okay, so right now we have about 48% of the participants have voted, is that good? I'm gonna end the poll right now and share the results. All right, and so I'm looking. Whoop, sorry, I'm looking for the results. Is that something I should see now? Yeah. Okay. It's it, right now it says I am sharing. Has it popped okay. up yet? Do people see the uh, results of the poll? Yeah, I had this problem. Uh, I'm doing a lot of these. <laughs> I had the same problem yesterday. I couldn't figure out. They saw the results of the first poll, but not the second poll. So, uh, right, so we'll I'm going to stop that. Why don't I stop and then share again? Yeah, relaunch. Let's try re that. Relaunch. Relaunch results. Um, it's not that important that we all see, but it's important for you to acknowledge where you are with flipped learning. So everyone's at a different point. And that's important to understand too. And the reason it's important is that I know there are a lot of you, but you're connected. You're on the same list. So because some of you know more about flipped learning than others, you can help each other. And then not to embarrass her, but you have someone right there on Long Island who is an expert on flipped learning, and that's Heather. So you should be following up with her if you answered uh, any of the not never heard of it or not sure what it is, et cetera. Okay. But after this webinar, you should have a better idea. And we're gonna start by giving you the definition. So this is the basic definition of flipped learning, uh, which I helped write, as you can see the citation down at the bottom there. I was on the board of the Flipped Learning Network when we created this. So it's flipped learning is a pedagogical approach in which direct instruction moves from the group learning space, from the classroom to the individual learning space and the resulting group space is transformed into a dynamic interactive learning environment where the educator guides students as they apply concepts and engage creatively in the subject matter. Now that alone we could spend time on, but I wanna point out a couple of things. Number one, I'm using Bloom's taxonomy towards the end, right? Apply application and create, engage creatively. So we're looking for that. I would add, if I were writing it today, I would add in the first section about direct instruction that also direct instruction, which you're farming out, to outside of the classroom as your pre-work and your assignments, that direct instruction should also be transformed into a dynamic interactive learning environment. And that's what I'm gonna show you today. And on the right, you have the four pillars. Uh, and if you, uh, if you go to the website of the Flip Learning Network, oh, I didn't mean to hit stop share. I did that again. That's something I do now and then, okay. I'm gonna do a share again. Uh, you go to the website 
of the flipped learning network. And you see their definition, or our, I should say, definition. And in addition, they have a, they have a checklist of indicators. All right, you can see on the left, they're too small to read right now, but you go to the website. And uh, I would just say that I have added informally uh, under learning culture, which you're gonna learn about in a minute in PlayPosit, I've added a third indicator, which is to create fertile spaces, digitally, cognitively, psychologically, et cetera. Uh, so these, these are the indicators. It's a great checklist for flipped learning. Okay, and then I have to find my share controls. There we go. And I'm gonna go back to my PowerPoint. Okay, all right. So now we're gonna do poll three. One more poll here for you to respond to about your online plans. So if we can launch that. Does everyone see poll three? Do you want me to try and launch it? Or Heather, do you want me to relaunch it? You're on mute. So yeah, I'm not, it's, I'm going to end the poll. I'm going to try one more time to, oh, somebody's doing it. You got it, Krista? Somebody grabbed it. Uh, can everyone see it? All right, I'm going to stay away. I, I was, I'm a co-host, so I was trying to show the poll, but I'll stay away. I'll just yeah. be the guest speaker. <laughs> So we know that Zoom has been um, amazing, but a, like Helene had said, we actually ran into this ourselves um, at another meeting where for some reason the- Do you want me to try or? Sure, I just tried and it's- Not working for your desktop. Okay, so, um, so you wanna, um, I'm gonna, I see relaunch. I'm gonna try and relaunch. Let me try. Okay, right, you gonna try. It's going to for the previous two questions, though, just so you know. Oh, it just says share results. Polls been closed. Okay, let's do this one in the chat. So the poll asks you, are you planning to teach online asynchronously, synchronously, both, or you need a dictionary? Those are your choices. So please, everybody write down your choice and we'll crowdsource the answers later, looking at what people are putting. Uh, and uh, it looks like many of you are gonna say both. I would just like to put in a word that so many people say synchronous is too complicated, too tricky, not that important. And I hope by the end of this uh, time with me today that you are convinced how important it is to have synchronous communication with your students particularly in any, in any situation, but particularly with your K-12 uh, population. So, so and I'm seeing, the, yeah. I, I just so you know, I'm seeing a lot in the chat about uh, people doing both, but I did see an interesting thing, uh, one comment that dis the district doesn't want them to go live at this time. Um, yes, so yes, I've the, heard of that because of various issues that have nothing to do with pedagogy. And I, I understand that there's a, you know, I'm always thinking, I'm, I'm always thinking of the pedagogy first and the other considerations, work it out, figure it out, okay? So, um, so I understand there are issues that um, may prevent that but you might be able to do some kind of a workaround, even if you meet synchronously with one student at a time in a confidential setting. It's very important to maintain the personal connection. You see me, you hear me, I'm your teacher, you know me. That is priceless, priceless. Even if it's a 10 minute check-in each week, how are you? Okay. We need to move on, but thank you for that. I understand. And I should say that uh, one thing that's important here is what the webinar is and what the webinar isn't, okay? So um, 
I'm not actually focusing on English learners today, except for one or two slides at the end. I'm trying to teach you a model, a template. And the idea of this template is you can apply it to any situation, including PD. I heard Krista say earlier that you're taking your PD, and that I'm doing this with another BOCES too, you're trying to put your PD online. And if you do that, SOFLA can help you. Uh, so this is a model of delivering online instruction that if you do all eight steps, will be very effective. But you are already knowledgeable about the content and the methodology that you use in teaching. So, so if I pick a particular situation, it's the one that I use and I know about, and then you will apply it to your situation. So that's, that's a very important point. Okay? It's the principles I'm showing you, not the specific tools, not the specific grade level. That's not what we're doing today, all right? Just the steps. So I'm gonna take you through the eight steps. If you like to do screenshots, and I know I do, uh, this would be the shot, okay? So this would be the shot. I give you a second to take it. I have been giving you a second. I wonder how many have already taken the screenshot. These are the eight steps. And what we're going to do is uh, we're going to go through these eight steps rather quickly, just so that you get the flavor of this model, okay? Uh, the, I would like to mention also, just briefly, that before you do anything, it's a good idea to create a video just talking about how to be an online learner. You know, we're talking today about how to be an online teacher. But what I do with my students, and you do it age appropriately, English proficiency appropriately, but with your webcam and your audio, do a little video with some slides and do some tips. I have one I'm happy to share with you, would not be appropriate for your setting, but I have 10 tips how to be a successful long line, online learner in my class. And I, I give it to all my students, they watch it. I also have the PowerPoint slides and a written document because one of the keys for online instruction is to give multiple pathways for the same content. Most of them prefer the video, but some want the PowerPoint slides, they want the document. So always give them access. But what are you going to say to them about being an online learner? And we'll come back to that uh, later when we look at uh, what I asked you to do for your pre-work. Okay, I think I gave you a chance and now we're gonna go into the steps. So step one, now I, I do have on the left teaching and on the right PD, I don't always do that, but I know that this is an Arburn uh, sponsored presentation and many of you in your districts are doing PD or you, you have strong teachers who are doing PD and I know the Arburn does PD. So I have that on the right. Okay, on the left, the pre-work, what I do usually is that's my direct instruction, that's my lesson, okay? And I'll show you at the end a slide that gives you many, many more options of what you can flip besides the actual content direct instruction, because that's only one of many options. But for now, this is when you flip outside of class. Whatever you flip, you want it to be targeted with embedded questions and activities. You don't just go, blah, 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 blah. They'll go to sleep, they'll go off and do other things and answer the phone. So you wanna make sure that you're engaging them in a way that they will be interacting. Then you take the data and you download it because you've asked them questions. So you use an application, I'm gonna show you one, but there are many more and Heather is very well versed in this kind of thing. She can take you down the, that road. Uh, but the idea is to get data and you want to analyze the data before you see them so that anything that was very clear, you don't need to worry about, except maybe there's one student and then you can meet with that one student. It's very effective to do this. And then you looked at the ones that were not clear to most of the class. That's how you start your lesson when you come in and work with them, okay, with what you need to clarify. Now for PD, I don't need to talk about it. Uh, too much because we, we're doing it, we did it. 
but the video was to introduce me. Uh, I asked you questions to get your current thinking and how much you knew about the concepts we'd be doing. And I gathered some data to figure out uh, what you were expecting from the, from the training. And that's very valuable because I know a lot of you put things in your pressing issue, which is very important, the pressing issue that we're not going to talk about today at all. So it's very important to me to be able to clarify for you what this is and what this isn't, because one person is not going to address all your needs. What I'm giving you is a template with eight steps. There are other people who can work on the many issues you cited. But asking pressing issue is a very effective way, much more effective than saying, what topics would you like to be trained on? OK, we know what topics because that's the pressing issue list. Also, when you ask them one idea they already have, that was my second one. I think I have this on a, on a slide next coming up. Um, I'm just going to go down to this slide and I'll go back. Uh, I asked you one idea, you can crowdsource that together because everyone who answered the pre-work came up with an idea. Look at how many ideas you now have that you've submitted to BOCES and they can work with those ideas and share them out. Um, then I asked you your experience as a learner because again, as I said before, you want to think of yourself, what, what do I want my learners to be doing that's going to help them? And if you think of yourself as a learner, that's a starting point. Always put yourself in that situation to help, to help your students then uh, know what to do, okay? So I asked you what you thought would help you as an online learner. Put, always get the other perspective, not always look your teacher hat, get your learner hat. And then where are you located? Well, it's good to have just a personal question and I like sometimes to make one of those word clouds and find out you know, where most people are. Uh, some of you put Long Island, that's okay. Um, it's not as specific. But uh, anyway, we have that data. I live in White Plains. I guess you gathered that. Okay. And then I did want to get what you took away from the reading. All right. So that's the pre-work. Now I want to go back to play posit. Uh, this is what I'm going to show you now. I'm going to go through very quickly um, a three minute video with questions to show you what the pre-work looks like. Okay. You're going to be answering in the chat. But if we were doing a longer version of this, which is a totally separate uh, training, if you wanted to learn play posit, it, it's it is complicated. So this isn't to teach it to you. This is just to give you uh, an example of uh, what it looks like to go into uh, a pre-work video. Now I've done this video for you. So this is not, again, this is not for L's. This is for you guys. So that's the whole point of it. Uh, and this is PlayPosit. It's like anything else. You have an account and uh, I have classes. You can see my grammar classes there, but I have a flipped learning class, which we're going to go into. And I have a longer version of this, but this is the three minute one. It's got little edits in it, so it's not perfect, but I wanted to give you a three minute. All right. So here we're going to do the three minute. We're just going to preview it and bear with me as we go through this. I keep looking at the clock and talking faster and faster. Okay. So here we go. All right, and you should video lesson you hear it? on so flip learning. Yes. And okay. this is your guide to creating a learning culture. I'm going to make it fast. Learning, learning culture is speed. one of the four you pillars. You can change the speed in PlayPosit. You can slow it down for your Marshall, L's. You can make it faster. Guide. You can so make it louder. Let's look at the learning culture pillar. Here are the tenets of the pillar. First, that in a traditional model, the teacher is primary in terms of the source of information. But in flipped learning, we shift that instruction to a learner-centered approach. And so class time is more dedicated to exploring topics in much greater depth, and it creates learning opportunities that are very rich for our students. Students become more involved in constructing knowledge, and they participate actively in class and evaluate their learning in a way that is personally meaningful. So we're going to take a look at all of this, taking a deep dive. And here we go. Now I hope you paid attention because here's your first question. First. Ready? Answer the question. We'll just do it by A, B, C, D. So the first one is A and so on. What's the correct answer, everyone? Come on, let's go. Put it in, A, B, C, D. 
what is not true. And remember, we have to teach else. This is the kind of tricky stuff that we love to do on standardized tests that not, but we're not doing test taking strategies today. Okay, most of you got the answer, which is B. Now watch what happens. You answer B, then you sit, hit submit. Until you hit submit, you know, you don't, you don't see. And then you see correct. And I always say why. You know, people say, oh, correct, move on. No, why is it correct? Why were you correct? Critical thinking. And if they get it wrong, I tell them why. And they see what the correct answer is. And after they've done that, they hit continue. And only then do they get to see the rest, the next thing that comes along. Teacher talk. So the research shows that 65 to 90% of class time is teacher talk. This can be from directions and procedures, explanations and clarifications, or feedback and evaluation. So take a minute to self-assess and think about your own classes. Okay, so what do you think? Teacher talk in your class, how much is teacher talk? The point being that in flipped learning, it goes way down and you'll see. Give a percentage in the chat, let's go. We want you to be active learners on modeling interaction and activity. Let's go. Be honest, guess. It does, it's not that important, but just guess. Just give me a percentage. All right, you know what? I'm gonna go with a general flow here. I'm looking and a lot of you put above or below 50, but let's go 50, submit. And there it's a poll, it's not correct or incorrect. It's for, for me to get an idea of where my students are with that. So we now continue. Our next concept is hand raising. There is some soft data on this showing that 80% of the time, 20% of the students are hand raisers. Either they're answering display questions, in other words, they know the answer, or they're providing unsolicited contributions to the instructional conversation, something they feel they wanna add or say without being called on, or they raise their hand to ask a question. This could be about directions or about the content. Uh, so take a minute and think about the extent of hand raising uh, in your classes. All right, so what percent of your students raise their hands in general? What percent? Think about now you're doing face to face your regular instruction. And the point here is that in online instruction, everybody, you can have everybody answer everything. You don't have to worry about raising hands and uh, you can have them participate like I'm doing right now. Everyone's answering in the chat. Okay, so a lot of the quieter students participate both synchronously and asynchronously. You get much more participation. So a lot of you are going with the 20%. Usually the groups that I work with go a little higher, but you're probably being more honest. So I'm gonna hit submit and then continue. We're almost done, but it's worth going through this to show you how it works is the way we're doing right now, they watch their video lesson and they get feedback from me on each question they answer. And you can see the green are the ones that they got correct and the red, the ones that they had trouble with. This is a question of with 31 students. And also they can give feedback. So I can see their score on the questions and they can rate the video. She gave it a five out of five, which is great. And then she, but she gives a lot of comments about what was hard for her, what, what she didn't understand, etc. So feedback in both directions, which enables me to differentiate instruction and scaffold it properly. Okay, now give I, me your feedback. And uh, I just want to, and we can discuss flipped learning together. Okay. Um, I just want to mention that that's the way PlayPosit shows you your data, and you can see the green would be what I wouldn't have to worry about except for those few students, and the red tells me, whoa, that's not something they, they got. I can redo the video uh, so that that's clearer, and or I can teach it when I meet them or teach it if you're doing all asynchronous. Um, so, um, by the way, someone said something about editing and they get frustrated. I did read your pre-work. Uh, so, no, 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 never edit. <coughs> That's a fake cough. Okay. <coughs> oh, sorry, just a minute, glass of water. They're your students, who cares, okay? This is being recorded right now and everyone just saw that, okay? It doesn't matter. The worst thing to do is to try and be perfect. The best you did 
The best you can do, it's perfect. Don't worry about it. We're not doing productions. We're doing lessons. Thank you. Okay, now you see what's up there. What did you think? You just had a quick three minute one, but go ahead. What did you think? So I always ask my students what they thought. What do they think? So what did you think? So please tell me what you think in the chat. Come on, let's go. <laughs> I can't tell if people are their connection or their, okay, we're getting a lot of liked it. So I'm going to click liked it. And then the last piece, it didn't work yesterday. Yes. Okay. The last piece is for you to say something about it. This is where, if you saw that student, she said, oh, this part was great. I really understand it now. This one wasn't so clear for me. So everybody just put, you can just put in the chat. Any reaction you have to the three minute demo of PlayPosit about learning culture pillar in flipped learning. And then whatever you put in, there's no, there's no data that comes from that. That's anecdotal data that I get from every single participant. So you can put that in the chat now. And I'm just gonna put uh, thank you because I was the one that made it. I don't know, just put thank you. Okay, and then we're done, okay? And that's how you do um, play deposit. So now I'm going to get back to my PowerPoint. So Helene, and as I, I said, I have an interesting question in the chat. I don't know if you want to yes. speak to it very briefly, sure. Um, sure. because uh, someone's mentioned grades K through three and how it might work for the lower grades. So I thought that's a good one to um, comment. Right. On. Well, I'm not. I'm not a K through three person, and so what I would say is you can be the best people to decide how that goes. And I think you have people in your group who teach that age group regularly and can say, I do with my K3. I'm not the person to ask, but I would say that PlayPosit might not be the tool for you. You might wanna use Edpuzzle or you might wanna use Flipgrid. So there are many different tools. I use PlayPosit, that's why I'm showing you PlayPosit. I don't necessarily recommend this specific tool, but you still wanna have some very basic questions. And you can do it you know, in the native language, the questions, because if you're getting at what they understand about something, there's no reason not to if, if you're interested. So I think that you can subsequently talk about that in small groups. We're not doing breakouts today, but if I were doing a longer session, we'd have breakouts according to grades and you would come up to, with you know, a mini video for your grade, what would you do? What would you put in the video? What would you put for your questions? So again, it's principles, not the actual application. Yes, play posit, I did on the corner of my eye see the chat, there are captions. I didn't have them in. Some of my students say they're annoying. Of course, they wouldn't be annoying if they were L's. Okay, MLLs. Yeah, and I have to say that, um, you know, People keep asking about purchasing, you know, it's not free, but to another uh, point around the kindergarten through three, we have some great examples in, on Long Island, uh, Hicksville uses Seesaw with the K through three group. Yeah. Fabulously, it works. Yeah, I've, it's a matter I've heard of knowing. Of CISO. Yeah, Seesaw yeah. works really well for flip learning in the lower elementary grades. Yeah, I was just talking yesterday with someone who teaches up in Chappaqua and she was showing me Seesaw and I had never seen it. And I said, Seesaw, that's awesome. Awesome. <laughs> so I haven't had a chance to look at it. It was supposed to be great. And it works with Google Classroom if that's what you have. So yeah, absolutely. Okay, so that's step one. And I just um, want to say something about step two, which is the sign-in. Uh, do we have a hard stop at 1030? Okay. Um, step two is a sign-in. And some people say, oh, that's your do now. No, this is not a do now. Okay. Um, Usually do now has to do with the content. Watch what I do. So last night, my students do multicultural perspectives. So I wanted to make sure they read chapter seven in the ATO's Affirming Diversity. So I said, what is the relationship between a deficit view and social justice? Can teachers help? So they each had to come up with their idea of what teachers can do to combat the deficit view. And Nieto had a lot of ideas in that chapter. So what they do is when they come in, there's a whiteboard, just like there is here in Zoom. And everybody comes in, this is how I take attendance. 
they come in, they sign in with their name, and they answer whatever the question is for the sign-in. If it's going to be very difficult, sometimes I give them a head up and one, heads up in one of my announcements, and I say, the sign-in is going to be blah, blah, blah. Uh, many times I don't. So last week, I actually asked them how COVID-19 is affecting them professionally or personally, and I gave them a chance to express that because the elephant in the room is that. And if you never bring it up, then they they're not as engaged because they've got this thing building up, right? So the affective domain is really important in the sign-in. Sometimes you need to do a sign-in that treats that issue that everybody is facing. Um, then two weeks ago, I did a direct one on the video and I don't ask for a specific item because I've already got that data. I want, what, are they, what sticks from the video? What puzzled them in the video? What inspired them? So you ask different, questions about the video and you get different answers that way so it's not a yes no or correct and then everyone reads the board and what i say is okay read the board what do you notice and i ask them to see if they see patterns and pe what people were surprised by etc um, and then um three weeks ago going way back i asked them what their plans were for spring break that didn't work out so well but anyway they did have plans we all had plans okay the third is what i call the dangerous step Step three is whole group application. Now, this is where you have to not be your old teacher teacher, okay? It's led by you, it's led by you, but you're not talking, you're not member teacher talk, it's guided by you. And what you're doing is you're classifying concepts based on the pre-work, all right? You're, if, if they did understand a concept, you're applying it. To, you're applying the new concepts, applying the new work that you put in the video. That was the whole point of flipping and you encourage them to interact. And you can use the whiteboard, the chat box, the audio. So in my class, I'm doing something in second language acquisition. We were contrasting natural language acquisition, structured-based classrooms and communicative classrooms. And I had given them a whole list of characteristics of each of all mixed up together, and they had to sort them into three categories collaboratively on the whiteboard, the whole class did it. So that gives you an idea. And then if they were having trouble, I'm there, I am their teacher. So I do step in, but I basically, I'm guiding the activity, but they're actually doing it. Sorry, okay, let's go to the next. So step four, I don't need to say a lot about step four because you, know, you already know. And this is one of the points I'd like to make here about online is that you're not starting from scratch. You're educators, and so much of what you already know and you already do, you need to transfer it to online. So I'm trying to give you some ways to transfer it, some structure to make it work, but a lot of it will transfer beautifully, and group work is one of those things because you can have them in breakouts, and you can even do this asynchronously. You can have them, and I've done that, you have them break into groups and work separately, and then they can come back into a whole group and share what their group came up with. All of that can be done asynchronously. Uh, I do it you know, in my actual class, but you have a jigsaw model, you have the same activity model, and the accountability is there because you can get the names of who is in each group. Last night I had one group was very strong, they came up with a lot, and the other group said, well, we didn't write much, but we had a really good conversation. So, <laughs> you know, but anyway, and you can visit the groups, okay, as you can asynchronously, obviously, but synchronously too, all right? You can get individual names, you can ask for when they come back from the group, for them to speak, uh, you can have a spokesperson or you can say, I want everyone in the group to say something. You're teachers, you do what you want. And then as far as grouping, that's totally teacher's choice, right? You know about grouping, I'm gonna just skip that. Who needs to tell you guys about that? Okay, depends on the audience for the detail I go into. All right, uh, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this and kind of kind of skip it. Um, but I was going to show you a peer instruction video that one of my students did on pronouncing the past tense, the three pronunciations of past tense. But, um, but what I do, and this may not apply in your case, but peer instruction is another option. And I thank um, my colleague Carolina Rodriguez uh, Butrago for pushing me to do peer instruction in my grammar class. So each student has a tiny piece of grammar and they prepare a video lesson and questions and, I, and, I, and a quiz at the end, and it's real instruction, but I do it as part of the breakouts. So they're not scared because they don't have the whole class there, they just have a breakout. 
I can tell you much more about the peer instruction component. It was mentioned in the articles if you read the articles, but I'm gonna move on so that we have more time. Then they come back and they share. All right, again, this is your pedagogy. You can make a choice of how they share, but it's very important after breakouts, and again, you know this, you don't just send them off and then say, okay, everyone back. You have to have some reason that when they come back, they're accountable to share. That's important. And one of the things that I notice in peer feedback, and I just went to a webinar yesterday where I felt like they fell a little short on talking about feedback. They had the feedback sandwich or bun or something like that. Everybody likes that. I think that's too evaluative and I don't care for that approach. I like the shack. And uh, this again, I'm just telling you the shack. I'm not going to go into it today. But it's my colleague, uh, uh, Khalid Fethi. He's actually from Morocco. We have a wonderful project we do together called the International Film Club. That's something else to talk about someday. But it's share, help, ask, comment. So you tell the students you have different things you can do to give feedback in a blog, in a wiki, in a discussion forum. You have an option to share an idea that fits with what the other person said. You can help them with something that you think maybe they need a little help with. You can ask them a question, or you can simply give a general feedback type of comment. And I found that when students have just enough structure, they participate more in feedback. You know how the feedback is always kind of, uh, how do they give feedback? They're not teachers. They're not like you. They need to be taught how to give feedback. And it really makes a, a big difference to use Shack. Uh, so next is step six. Now, a lot of people skip step, step six, I mean me, <laughs> because they run out of time. Like I did just now, running out of time. But, uh, because I like to go into things more and then I run out of time. But I try to do this because if you don't do the preview with the discovery activities, they're less motivated to do the assignment and you want them to do the assignment. So you look at it together. You don't just give an assignment. If it's a book, you look to the book, you put it on online, you know, most books you can put there and you look and you say, well, you're going to be reading this. So what do you think about this? And then of course they won't know because they haven't read it yet, but you get an idea of problems. Pop, it's like a problem posing with all a good old Friar. Okay. And I see um, it's being recorded. So you're okay. I understand you have to go. So um, you introduce new terms and concepts that they're going to find when they do the assignment. All right. And you're motivating them. You're getting them curious and interested. And also what I do, do use it for is assessing their prior knowledge of the upcoming material. Okay? So that's really, really important. Okay. And now we come to step seven, which is a reflection page. I always ask students to reflect at the end of class, not just here's the assignment. Goodbye. But what sticks with you? And I, I, this is not an exit ticket. You know, some people say, oh, they, she does a do now and an exit ticket, but online. No, it's not an exit ticket. Because what this is, is something that sticks with them. Again, I believe in the what sticks method. Everybody had takes something different away and let them do it on the whiteboard and they all see what everybody took away. It's collaborative. We, ought, we talk about collaboration, but do we do it? So here we are. Reflection page is collaborative. And I always post the sign-in and the reflection page and the breakout results all go up online on your platform so they can see it. Okay. And it can, it can relate to anything. Just to one or two sentences. They have to reflect. They can't just say, great class, learned a lot. I erase it if they do. I say, nope, sorry. And then they learn very quickly. <laughs> um, and then we post it. All right. So there it is. That's, by the way, free to use or share. Can you believe that picture is free to use or share? I only use free to use or share. There's only one picture in here that wasn't, and I had to use it because it was so awesome. I don't know if you can figure out which one, but I do believe in the licensing. Okay, last thing is the assignment. I don't even need to show you this. It's the assignment. You do an assignment. Now, I do recommend number one here, which is video lesson with questions. That's my number one. But I also assign readings and blogs and wikis and blah, blah, blah. Okay, assignment, you don't need that from me. Follow up is just for your PD people. So I always do this, this, this is a list for PD. So if you're interested for PD, you can go back and look at my PowerPoint that I'll make available and you can see all the possible PD uh, um, follow-ups, all right? But it is important to follow up. If you're doing flip PD, you have to follow up. You don't just say goodbye. 
and give them their credit or their hours or whatever. Um, I threw this in. Uh, this is something that came through on a presentation I did for ELLS. I noticed in your pre-work, so many of you are concerned about ELLS, and I know that, but I, my focus was, again, the template. But remember when I said you don't just flip the content, the direct instruction? So this slide, again, if you want to do a screenshot, go to town, do your screenshot. Uh, I'm not talking about it. <laughs> it's a different presentation. There are like 10 million presentations <laughs> built into this one. And this is the other one. And um, Heather and I uh, were planning to do this at TESOL. So hi, TESOL, sorry you were canceled. We'd be presenting today, but you never know. Okay. <laughs> All right, these are the four questions. And again, I'm not taking time, but these are the four questions to ask when you flip, uh, whether it's SOFLA or not but this is on SOFLA, so I just wanted to give you, those are the key questions. Nothing to do specific to ELLS, but just this is the best practice when you're thinking about flipping, okay? So out of class versus in class, comprehension and retention out of class, interaction and differentiation in class, and accountability in both. That's it, in a nutshell. That's what you need to be able to think about. Um, the final poll, because we are done, and I didn't go that far over, if you consider that we had trouble with some polls, because I did time this. Okay, so now um, will you take poll four, please? And um, I did put a, uh, a quote, which we probably can't see at the moment. So I do want you to reflect, just like I said, we're doing the modeling of the model, you know. So <laughs> I'm asking you to actually reflect. So there's a reflection. If you go to Google Docs, uh, go there is a reflection and you will, uh, there's a, oh wow, that's a long one. Okay, and you're going to go over and reflect. It's very quick, please do it, it's important. Now I'll, I'll make it competition. The people I trained yesterday, 35 people, 15 did it. You can beat that, come on guys, do your reflection, okay? Yeah, and so I am going to provide a, a shortened a bit.ly link, a shortened URL, and we will email it to all the participants. Um, so I, I know this link is, is too cumbersome. It was a, hold, okay. a space holder in the poll and, and okay. never replaced Actually, it. Actually, I short. have it on the, next, on the next slide, I think. Okay. Okay, so, so a lot of you are going to do it later because you're very, very busy folks. Somebody said, forget about it. Oh, one person, that's very New York, right? <laughs> I think someone I had from Pakistan yesterday didn't put, he thought it probably meant I might forget about it, <laughs> but I meant it in the New York way. That's an interesting lesson for me. Okay, uh, do I have one more slide? This is your reflection and there's the bit.ly link. And thank you. I really enjoyed working with you guys. I can't wait to read the real chat, the whole chat. <laughs> thank you, goodbye. Thank you so much, Helene. That is an amazing amount of information that I think is so relevant in these times. Um, so I just want to thank you again. I, I can't uh, tell you enough how much we appreciate you sharing this message. And uh, I know everybody must have so many um, follow-up <laughs> questions. And I just want to say that, you know, we're here for you. And this is going to be, we're in for the long haul. This isn't going away. Flip learning isn't going away. Online synchronous, asynchronous, blended learning isn't going away. So we're going to work at this. Thank you so much, Helene, for your time. We really appreciate it. Yes, Everyone in the chat welcome. window is sharing their appreciation as well. Okay. Thank you. I 1000 percent. I just want to underscore that. Thank you so much, Helene. We, there's so much to unpack here and I'm scribbling notes away and looking things up while you were talking. So I'm, I'm going to have to rewatch it <clears throat> and see what little tidbits I missed as well. Um, and I just want to remind everyone, if you haven't, if you joined us a little bit later and you didn't put your name into the group chat, that's how we're t tracking attendance. So just write your name in there if you did not do it earlier. Um, and okay, wait, I'm going to take the screen back over. And now we're going to switch to um, poll can go away, the group chat can go away. OK, now we're going to switch over and learn about some online resources through Discovery Ed. Gaetano, I believe you also 
have. Right, right. So it's a pleasure to introduce Ann Weiss from Discovery Education. Um, so they have a subscription uh, to online resources that they've made available. And she'll talk about that and, and show that in, in shortly. But just a little bit about Ann Weiss. She's been in education sales here on Long Island for about 15 years. And she lives out here on Long Island uh, with her three children and her husband, who's a middle school teacher in New York City. So uh, Anne is a senior manager for education partnership at Discovery Education. And she's really thrilled and excited to be partnering with districts here on Long Island to provide dynamic digital learning environments that improve student achievement. So now I'm going to pass it over to Anne. Anne, you're there. Uh, I was on mute. Yes, I am here. Can everybody hear me? Is that a yes? That's a nod. I see you. Yes. yes. All right. Great, great, great. So I'm very pleased to have a few minutes on your agenda today. And I do all, always highlight that uh, I live here on Long Island. I think that's kind of special because certainly at Discovery Education, I think in the uh, history of Discovery Education, no one has represented from Long Island. And I feel like it's all happening here. I do uh, have three children, uh, school age children in the district um, that I live in in Plainview. So uh, I love working with my Long Island partners and consider myself an advocate as well uh, for the partners. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And just let me know if you can see. That's a thumbs up, Krista, I'm looking at you. <laughs> thumbs up, all right. Let me just run this here. And I do work with a team of people. Uh, again, I am the Long Island representative, uh, but I have a couple of other folks, Kelly Hose, who's the senior director, and Renee Cartier, uh, who works with me on professional learning. So I just wanted to give a little background and I always start with a little song because the unknown thing that I didn't put in my bio is I was once a professional singer. Actually, I am a professional singer. So starting at the beginning, I sing something like, let's start from the very beginning. It's a very good place to start. And then I get to ask you where that is from. Anybody? Anybody know where that little ditty is from? I'm gonna say a Disney movie. Disney, mm -hmm. anybody else? The Sound of Music. Yes, Krista, The Sound of Music. <laughs> very good. So starting at the very beginning, uh, Discovery Education is a natural extension of our parent company, Discovery Communication. So some of you may or may not know that. Uh, and I'm going to guess that you have watched once, twice, maybe a thousand times, some of the channels here from Animal Planet to HGTV. And what is new to Discovery Communication as well is the Scripps Network. So now we own all of the Food Network channels. And the reason I point this out is because we're able to leverage a lot of these rich resources and embed it into our service. And also importantly, we are a global company. So we live in a global marketplace and we are globally sharing something called the coronavirus. So you are certainly in good company in terms of the folks that we represent and the people that we are touching as far away as Chile, as far in the south as Chile. And we are also have a strong footprint in the UK. And we are working with uh, Egypt building their K-12 uh, resources with a STEM focus. We've been working with the uh, Egyptians for many years and will continue on that journey with them. So to that end, we are touching roughly 50 million students, although that is expanding. We actually just brought on the New York City Public Schools uh, Department of Education, so they have access to our resources as well. So we have to bump that number up a bit, and we're touching about five, uh, 4.5 million educators. Oh, let me see if I can advance the slide, there we go. Additionally, what we bring to our service is 
our corporate partnerships. So we do have uh, partnerships with like-minded organizations that we build resources on behalf of and embed them for free in our uh, resources that you're about to see. So from 3M to NASA, we have a wonderful partnership with uh, Major League Baseball. So when we talk about engagement for students, these are some of those resources that they can take advantage of. And this is just an overview of the digital resources that we offer. We do have something called Science Tech Book. I will mention that our tech books for science and for social studies are fully available in authentic Spanish as well. So right at the click of a button, you can create all that narrative is uh, transferred into authentic Spanish. Uh, we also have two different reading levels with our tech books. Today, we're gonna to look at Discovery Education Experience, which is our K-12 program. And free is good, right? We all love free. Uh, so one of the things that we've done to support our partners on Long Island, in the state of New York, and actually countrywide, is we are providing access for free to our Discovery Education Experience, which we will see in just a minute here. And I can put this in the chat, but, or if somebody wants to put it on my behalf, you can simply send an email to educationpartnerships at discoveryed.com and let them know that you would like to sign up your district for free access to Discovery Education Experience. That access does go through the end of the school year, which we believe now is June 30th. Um, whether or not we go back to school, that access will remain. And of course, here's my email address. So let me, uh, the other thing I should mention is that with our tech books, should you be interested in the tech book as well, we are also offering free access through the end of the school year. So math tech book is a secondary tech book. It does not have Spanish translation, but it is very engaging and it has embedded uh, corporate education partnership uh, information there. The science tech book is a K-12 resource. Social studies is middle school, so we're really looking at six through eight in terms of the content for social studies. So many of you whether you know it or not, it's because I've found partners that don't know that they are actually subscribing to Discovery Education Experience. So it may be living in your district, but perhaps you haven't seen it. We have gone through a major facelift. Um, Gaetano talked about United Streaming. So if you're looking at this now, you can see that this is your, not your old grandma's <laughs> United Streaming. We've actually given a major facelift uh, as of last summer. And what we've done in this uh, kind of overhaul is created what we call channels. So these channels have curated content, curated from our Discovery Education team uh, and from other educators across the country in which we have put sort of like as if you walk into a museum, you're looking at the best representation for medieval swords at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. That's the same curation that we've done with our channels. But before we explore that for a little bit, I did wanna highlight one of the things in my uh, discussions with partners across New York is this standards tab. And this is probably the favorite tab. So I'm going to, I'm in a demo account that's shows all the states. But I can look here for the state of New York and my, I'm in my standards tab. And if I scroll down to, this is the two, 2016 learning standards and these are the New York science learning standards here and click this hyperlink. I'm gonna drill into science. And you can see I have all grade levels here. When I click on grade four, 
I can expand the standards. So I can see all of the standards beneath this in engineering design. And you can see they're blue highlighted, which means that I can click on them and it will take me to all of the curated resources attached to this particular standard. So I can look and you can see most of them will be videos, which is what we are known for, um, starting with United Streaming. But I do have interactives that students can explore. I have a text option for science. This is going to show some of these hands-on activities. Images, providing background for students, associated with this particular standards, and of course, videos. This is in this case where the bulk of the resources are. And I show this to you from right to left instead of starting with videos to let you know and understand that we have multimodal resources. And this is a big differentiator with discovery education. We, it, this experience helps to differentiate instruction with multimodal digital content. Now this number is rather daunting at 781 videos. But you notice I have a filter here. And for EL students, it may be important to have closed caption video. So by clicking on this filter and closed caption, I then filter down to fewer videos with that closed caption icon. And let's open this video. This is about straws. I try to do my best not to use plastic straws. I do have reusable straws, which I hope is a lot better. Um, so you can see that we can play this video right here. And I have this closed caption icon. Hi, my name is Linda Booker and I'm a documentary filmmaker. So this obviously helps students um, to access content in two modalities, both the visual and strengthening their language skills. I can segment this video. So if I don't want to watch the 10 minute video, I can just segment in chunks. We've done this for you, created headings, so teachers can choose just that piece of the video that they want to show. But importantly, as well, for English language learners, we have transcripts for our videos. So students can watch the video and read here, but they can also see, as the video is playing, and the excerpts you're about to tracking see in a transcript. A film that I created called Straws. In the film, I explored the history of straws, why we're using them. And they can search the transcript. So we can put in ocean and the transcript will highlight with that word in context. So again, that's just one of the ways through our videos that we can support students. The video is downloadable. In fact, almost all of our videos are downloadable. So when we talk about uh, internet access or the fear of, well, I can't play this because it might uh, not be accessible, teachers can go ahead and download and pull that up offline. This content is assignable right here at point of use, or it can be shared through Google Classroom or uh, Microsoft Teams or Microsoft Office. Now I'm just going to go back quickly to my home page and share with you some channels. We talked about channels being a channel with curated content that we have created really for um, cultural awareness as well as some great EL resources. So 
we have a channel about uh, regarding holidays, observations, timely events. And this is sort of channels within a channel, if you will. So we have a channel dedicated to Ramadan, which may be coming up. Does anybody know? Did we miss it? So within this channel, oops, we have content here, images and videos to yeah. elevate and celebrate this particular particular culture. So Anne, I don't mean to interrupt you or cut you off, but we actually have um, someone from State Ed ah, who's gonna yeah, join no. us and talk about the seal of biliteracy and I think she's on a schedule. Yes. No worries. I appreciate the time and the opportunity. I'm going to put my email address or, uh, in the chat and uh, the way that uh, participants can sign up for the free resources. And I know I'm going to be meeting with your teachers on Tuesday, some of uh, the teachers that want to learn about the resources as well. So yes, that's right. We're having you back for our Tune in Tuesday. Which tune is in Tuesday, correct. Fantastic. On the 7th of April. So for those of you who are signed up for our tune in Tuesday, or actually we'll be sending the registration for that out later today, um, you'll be able to see the, more about Discovery Ed. And also we can leave this line open for a little while after the meeting if anybody has questions or wants to um, talk to you quickly. Great. All right. Thank so, you. I will and, stop share. Okay, great. Okay, so I can't believe where we've been at this for nearly an hour and a half. Um, um, I'm going to now introduce Candy Black, the as Associate for Instructional Services at the Office of State Education, sorry, nice said Office of Bilingual Education and World Languages. Um, and she's gonna talk to us about uh, how we're dealing with the field of biliteracy for the rest of the year. Candy, are you there? I am. Can I share my screen? Yep, go ahead. Perfect. Okay, well, hi, everyone, and thank you, Krista, for having me. I really appreciate this opportunity just to provide some uh, guidance in case anyone has any particular questions with regards to the seal of biliteracy under our COVID-19 school closures. Can all of you see the screen? Yep, we can see it. Okay, great. So um, feel free to chime in at any time and let me know if you have any particular questions. I'm gonna just walk you through um, the main issues and then there'll be a little bit of time at the end if you have some additional questions. Uh, so that you're aware, the guidance document was sent out on March 24th and posted to the website to all schools that have already notified us that they intend to offer the SEAL this school year. And it's designed as an FAQ to provide guidance specifically on the COVID-19 school closures and how that may impact schools' ability to implement the program. So the first question we've got is, can schools still offer the SEAL? And the answer is yes. As long as the students are able to meet the criteria to earn the SEAL, and that means three points in English and three points in a world language, then they can still earn it. We may just have to be creative about the ways in which they will submit the material or have um, their skills evaluated. Um, a big change this year was the inclusion of the culminating project notification form, which is one of the four forms required, and the deadline was set as April 15th. The purpose of this was to be able to sample about three to five schools per region, and there are seven regions in New York, so only about um, 20 schools total. That's less than 10% of the number of schools that actually offer the SEAL. And the idea was that I would be able to visit the school on a day when the presentations were being given to offer feedback and support to those schools in the culminating project process. Only schools that had offered the SEAL for at least two years were even being considered to be sampled. But given the extraordinary circumstances of our public health crisis, we are not going to do this this year. So the answer is, you do not have to submit, we're actually asking you not to submit the culminating project form for this school year. And very logically, we will not be visiting schools um, to do these student presentations, but I would like to put the invitation out there. If you would like us to attend any video conference, student presentations, 
I would be very happy to do so. And actually, I just did this in the Pine Bush School District over the last two days, and it was a fantastic experience. So this leads me to my next question is, given that students cannot be um, at school to give their presentations, can we conduct this via video conference? Yes both during school closures as well as after school closures, we have always allowed these culminating projects to be um, virtual if necessary. We can think of a lot of examples, whether students are ill or whether they are uh, traveling and it needs to get done. So we've allowed this in the past, we will continue to do this. Um, ideally, this is through video conference so that you can actually mimic as closely as possible what a live presentation would be like, including being able to see that the student is not, say, reading the text as opposed to spontaneously speaking. Um, but if the student does not have access to video conferencing software, we are allowing these um, presentations to take place just over the phone. By the same token, we did request that as much as possible, there be a panel of interviewers that evaluate student presentations and then speak to the students spontaneously after that, we realize that might be very challenging given school closures. So at this point, we're asking you to do your best. Um, and in some cases, especially with low incidence languages, this may mean that there would be only a single person who is interacting with the student for the evaluation. So again, do your best with this. Um, let's see, we want them to use audio and video whenever possible. Again, I talked about that already. Um, it's important though, if your school does move forward and use video conferencing or phone conferencing, which I guess we can put under the um, title of remote um, culminating project presentations, it's important to make sure that you're really identifying that all students who are candidates for the seal of biliteracy have been contacted and that you're making arrangements so that all students could potentially use this method in order to do their presentations. Our next question was, can SEAL candidates record their culminating project presentations and then turn in the recording? Uh, the answer to that is an unequivocal no. Um, unfortunately, this has several problems. One is it's an equity issue for students who may have access to uh, very high quality video editing and recording equipment. Um, two is it really doesn't allow the student presentations to be authentic in the way that a live one would. And third, and this is most important, it doesn't allow for the spontaneous interaction with the panel or the person interviewing. And this is a very important part of the presentation. It's that evaluation of the interpersonal speaking and listening skills. So no recordings will be permitted. Our next question was, should the SEAL request form and end of your data form, which are the list of the four forms required for this be submitted, be submitted and the two forms, the SEAL request and the end of your form um, are listed here. The question simply lists the number of seals needed by the school and the person to whom it should be sent. And obviously that may be something than the school address. We're hoping by the time these are sent, we'll be back in school. The end of your data form is the Excel spreadsheet that lists the student ID numbers, some demographic data, and how they earn the seal by checking boxes in the criteria. Will the May 31st deadline to submit these forms be extended? Absolutely. I want you to consider that while we call them deadlines for the seal of literacy, they're really just guidelines. Um, so for instance, the notification form was due on December 1st, and I've got them as recently as two weeks ago. So we wanna maximize the number of students and schools that are able to participate. So if you are not able to meet that deadline, please don't fret, we will work with you to make it work. Um, if you are going to have it ready by May 31st, please do send it in. Um, if not, don't worry about it. I will be reaching out to anyone um, who has not submitted a form by the deadline and just say, are you still doing this? And if so, when do you think you might get it in? And there's no penalty at all. Can a school receive the stickers for the diplomas and the medallions without submitting these two forms? No, um, the forms are required, um, although keep in mind that these deadlines are quite flexible. All right, so you have to have those in. 
Uh, let's see. Please keep in mind the lead time. It's going to take me about one week to process your form and mail the seals and medallions to your school. And of course, none of us know what the distribution of these are going to look like, whether you're going to be able to have a graduation ceremony. Um, but once you do know that information, please work back at least one week and make sure that you submit those forms so I can get you that graduation regalia within a reasonable time for you to distribute it. Uh, my last question here is when is the earliest that steel, steel stickers and medallions can be mailed? They will be mailed starting May 15th. So that is there is no hurry in getting the steel request or end of your data form in because even if you submit it tomorrow, we're not going to start mailing those out until May 15th anyway. Uh, this is my contact information. If you'd like to get in touch with me, you have my email there, candace.black at nysid.gov, and you have my direct line, 518-473-7505, and I'll make sure that I send this presentation to Krista in case there is any after video conference communication. She'll be able to send that directly to you, and this information is also available on her website. So I am going to share my Thank you so much, Candy. If you have time, we have a few questions. Sure. So the first one, does the student have to sit for a panel presentation? We're making efforts to do it remotely, but there may be extenuating circumstances for some students. In other words, there has to be a phone or video, does there have to be a phone or video conference for the SBL to be awarded? If the student is earning two points from a culminating project, the answer to that question is yes. The project must be presented in a video, audio, or live presentation. I want to make another extension in that in, in the unfortunate circumstance that schools do not go back. Uh, we're going to have to be creative in our solutions. But for instance, if we have a scenario whereby uh, schools don't go back, but uh, graduation maybe ends up being in August for ceremonies, you can actually complete the seal work after the normal graduation date. So if there's an opportunity to actually meet with the student at a safe time, you can do that as well. All right, great. So then there was another one from Alba who says, we were able to get our presentations in on March 11th, just in time. However, there are two students who never completed the Apple and the WPT writing. They are each missing one section. Can we proctor via Zoom to the best of our ability or is it a question for Language Testing International? That's an excellent question and we're gonna leave it up to the district. Some districts are going to take advantage of the uh, virtual or artificial intelligence proctoring services that are offered by Apple or LTI. Um, I think these are $5 extra per student. This isn't a requirement by the state. Schools can do that if they want. Schools can also do something as easy as saying, listen, this is a very unique time. We're gonna send home a very short statement to the student and the parent or guardian that simply says, the student and the parent or guardian certify that help was neither given nor received during the test and simply leave it at that. Okay, great. Uh, the next question is, is it better to request seals for all students who are attempting the seal, even if we aren't sure they will meet the criteria? I would say, uh, since we have a lot of flexibility with deadlines, if you would like to send in a seal request form, an end of year data form that anticipates those candidates you believe will earn the seal, feel free to do that and I'll send you that number of seals. Um, I think that teachers are pretty good at estimating who's going to come through successfully. You can give out then those seals once you've verified that the students have met the criteria. And if there's a couple of extra seals and medallions that you have that you end up not handing out, then Use those as display items in a bulletin board or with your guidance counselors. Awesome. Um, Mary, I just wanna say that the video, the recording of this, we're gonna be posting. So you can also share the link to your little share when we're finished. Um, and Melba Martinez asked, what is the latest date students can present their culminating project? So I'm going to leave that open because I don't know what's going to happen with the public health crisis. I'll give you a few scenarios. Scenario one, schools actually go back before the end of the year and graduation takes place. 
in that case, we would expect you to do the presentations at some point before graduation. If schools do not go back and graduation then becomes fluid, where schools set up ceremonies sometime during the summer, I would just ask that it, when, whenever the student graduates, you attempt to do the presentations prior to graduation. Know that other states allow submission of evidence of student mastery up until November past graduation, and New York wants to be as flexible as possible in order to allow for the COVID-19 crisis. Great. I think that's the end of our questions. Um, if anybody else has a final question, just put it in the chat right now. <laughs> and and uh, uh, we're actually over time now. It's 11.07. .07. I want to thank everyone so much for uh, joining us today and for um, joining us virtually here on the internet. Like I said earlier, it's really nice to see so many faces because we're all so isolated now. Um, my team, we have a Zoom meeting every morning and I really look forward to seeing the outside world. Um, I just wanted to um, follow up with one thing I didn't mention earlier is that we are sharing a lot of resources and information through our Twitter account. You don't have to be a member of Twitter to join or to follow us or to bookmark it. Um, so I know I have to share my screen. I'm just going to share my screen real quick and show you. Basically, if you go to twitter.com slash L-I-R-B-E-R-N, you can see all the things that we've been sharing. Um, and if you just bookmark that, you can access those resources without having to join Twitter if you don't want to. The other thing is, once we're finished up here, if you could log into my learning plan, um, we've added an evaluation form as part of the follow-up. So if you could fill out that evaluation and then also in the just let us know any other things that we might be able to do to support you or give us some ideas going for our Tuesday and possibly another maybe follow up Friday we're thinking about implementing. Um, that would be great. We need to know what you need from us. So with that, I think we're going to sign off. Thank you all. Stay healthy. And uh, have a great day. Bye, everyone.